All right, learning goals for sense organs. We have label the diagrams and know the functions of the components of the external, middle, and inner ear. Label the diagram and know the functions of the components of the eyeball and outer eye. Know the clinical applications of pain recognition and prevention of windup. And understand the role of olfactory senses in regard to appetite and how that relates clinically to the animals. <clears throat> so general types of stimuli, we have mechanical stimuli, which is touch, hearing, and balance. Thermal stimuli, so hot and cold. Electromagnetic stimuli, which is vision. And chemical stimuli, which is taste and smell. This is a good little chart to just, you don't have to know this chart at all altogether, but just to know that it exists. So we have visceral sensations, and they sense hunger, thirst, uh, hollow organ fullness, so thinking about the stomach, the intestines, and when those need to be either filled or emptied. And it uses the chemical and mechanical type of stimulus. Touch identifies touch and pressure, which are different, and it's mechanical. Temperature measures hot and cold, or it senses hot and cold, uses thermal stimulus. Pain is an intense stimulus of any type, and it's mechanical, chemical, or thermal. Proprioception is body position and movement, and that's mechanical as well. Visceral sensations are vague and poorly localized. There are sensations of hunger and thirst, and they also include visceral stretch receptors in the GI tract and the urinary tract. Um, this one's interesting. If we're thinking about the stretch receptors in the GI tract, it's important to note that they don't Animals typically don't have a lot of pain receptors in their intestines and in their stomach and in a lot of their uh, gastrointestinal organs. So for this reason, when an animal's sutures have come undone after surgery, sometimes if you work at an eMERGE clinic or a regular practice, um, you'll have an animal that had a spay surgery done a couple of days ago. They've been left in their house without a cone on, and it doesn't take long for that cat or dog to undo their sutures and then if they open up that incision and get to the point where there's organs hanging out they'll actually um, self-mutilate their intestines. Happens, you may or may not see it but the reason for that is it's clearly irritating them that it's hanging out. They don't like it to be hanging out, it's a sign of weakness so they'll go ahead and chew them off because they don't actually have a lot of pain receptors in their intestines. They have stretch receptors. So they'll feel the pain in their epithelium uh, around within their peritoneum, so around their abdomen and the, the epithelial tissue. They'll have pain receptors there, but not in their intestines, which is, you know, if you ever see that and you wonder, why, well, how the heck are they doing this to themselves and not even caring? That's why, because they don't have a lot of pain receptors in their guts. Touch and pressure, uh, tactile sense, so sensation of something being in contact with the surface of the body. Pressure is sensation of something pressing on the body surface. And pressure we feel all the time. It's whether or not we choose to be aware of it. Uh, the example that they give in your text is when you're sitting in a chair, different points of your body are under pressure all the time. Different points of your body are holding weight on that chair, and we may or may not notice them. Temperature. So we have a couple things to talk about. There's the superficial temperature receptors, so those are in the skin, and they detect upward or downward changes in the skin temperature. We have central temperature receptors, those are in the hypothalamus in the brain, that's an ancient part of the brain, and they monitor the temperature of the blood. It's also called the core body temperature. <clears throat> it's important to note that the central nervous system can activate mechanisms, so such as sweating, dogs and cats sweat in their paws, in the pads of their paws mostly, they don't sweat throughout their body. Horses do sweat throughout their body. But they'll activate sweating or piloerection. And piloerection, it's a good term to know, that's when the hair is standing up on the end. So it's when an animal has their hackles up or they, they use those tiny little cutaneous muscles to raise the, the hair so that it stands straight up and either help allow the cold air to come in or to trap the, the warm air to help regulate their body temperature. Important to note too, erectile temperature, so we all know where that goes, identifies the core temperature of the animal, while its axillary temperature identifies its superficial temperature. 
and it's not uncommon for these two temperatures to be off by a degree or two from each other. As you can imagine, the axillary temperature is generally a degree or two lower than the core temperature. Hyperthermia, really important clinical application regarding hyperthermia. Um, it's important to remember that dogs and cats can't cool off as easily as humans. Okay, so when you're in a hot car and you think the car is hot, the dog and the cat feel that almost double because they don't have those mechanisms to sweat and relieve some of that heat. It doesn't take much for an animal to overheat, and once their temperature begins to reach dangerously high levels, they'll start to lose consciousness, convulse, and die um, quite quickly. So always keep that in mind. If you ever have a client or if you see a dog in a parking lot, left in a car, if the sun's shining and it's above, you know, it's 20 degrees, even 20 degrees, that is way too hot to leave the dog in the car. Way too hot. Same with kids. Same thing. But it's definitely way too hot. And I think there's a lot of public education about that lately, which is really, really important. Um, I remember once at the Emerge Clinic, we had a dog who was spayed on a Friday, and on Saturday it was 35 degrees out, and they took the dog, it was a golden retriever, they took it, hacking it up with the horses for three hours that morning. Dog was fine, dog was great, and then about five, four, no, probably about three hours after they had brought the dog in, they went to go wake the dog up, dog wouldn't get up, and then they realized, hey, the dog's unconscious. So this dog they had had out when it was had a shaved belly, so it couldn't use piloerection on that area of its belly. It was exposed to the warm temperatures. It was a heat wave, and they had it overexerting itself with uh, exercise that morning. So the dog came in, was unconscious, non-responsive, and uh, its body was dying from the inside out because its core temperature was about 43 degrees. It was pretty awful, but it doesn't take much. Uh, hypothermia can be just as dangerous as well. It's important to recognize hypothermia when animals are under anesthetic. This is our role. So we'll always take a rectal temperature when the animals are under anesthetic. When we place them, uh, when we sedate them even, they start to lose body core temperature. When they're under general anesthetic, we're taking away their thermo receptors. We're taking away their ability to thermoregulate themselves. So we have to compensate for that by using warming devices. Also very important, when using warming devices, you have to be very, very careful to move those warming devices around on the animal to ensure that they're not getting a buildup of heat in one specific area. If they have that, they can get quite serious third-degree burns, lose all their hair, have ulcerated skins, and it's pretty horrible. Um, another thing just to keep in mind, too, and Chris Brown, if you have him, if you're in BB, you'll have him next semester, and I know he talks about this in surgery a fair bit, but when an animal is losing heat, they lose heat faster by conduction than they do by convection. So what this means is, even though we have a nice warm room, we've pumped lots of nice warm air into it, temperature feels great, that would be con convection, okay? The warming or cooling based on the air blowing by the animal or surrounding the animal. If we have that nice warm room and we have a sedated or anesthetized animal and we still place them on a cold steel table, regardless of the temperature of the air of the room, they're going to lose that heat through conduction. So they're going to lose that heat through the surface that they're touching, which is that cold table. So next we get into the pain processes. So there are four steps. There's transduction, which is the conversion of painful stimulus into nerve impulse. And that's down here. So sore toe, transduction. We have transmission, which is the conduction of a nerve impulse into the spinal cord. Okay, so it's bringing it up the nerves in the leg, perhaps the sciatic nerve, up into the spinal cord. Modulation changes the sensory nerve impulse. It can amplify or suppress the sensory impulses. Okay, so modulation happens along the spinal cord. And perception is the conscious awareness of painful stimuli. It's good to know those four and where they occur within the animal. It's also really important to understand, in general, the process of pain in order to create and utilize new and improved methods for controlling pain. There's been a recent movement in the vet industry over about the last 10 years in preventing pain wind-up, and wind-up is talked about in your text. 
wind up is the concept that although the brain is unconscious and doesn't perceive these pain impulses during surgery or anesthesia, the spinal cord is still undergoing modulation and can amplify these pain impulses. The impulses can result in continued or intensified pain once the animal has woken up from surgery. It is much, much, much easier to prevent this windup, so to prevent a spike in the pain, than it is to control it once that animal has peaked in pain. So keep that in mind whenever you have an anesthetic or, uh, sorry, a surgery specifically. If it's a painful surgery, which generally most are, you have to have what's called an analgesic on board. And that's analgesic is another term for pain medication. So oftentimes with surgery, we'll give them an analgesic mixed with a sedative, and that helps sedate them. And I'm going to have to go get my charger. And then we'll give them an analgesic during surgery and one after surgery. And this is just going to pause for two seconds. Okay, <laughs> we'll carry on. So generally, anytime we're doing a surgery, we have analgesics throughout the surgery and post-surgical, and then we monitor that patient incredibly closely to ensure that they're not going to get any pain associated with their surgery, or at least that they'll have controlled pain. <clears throat> it's also really important to know that as a registered vet tech, you'll be the individual responsible for recognizing signs of pain and this is signs of pain in various species. So if we think about, pardon me, a dog or a cat in pain, um, I assume you can picture what they look like. A little bit of wince dies. They might have a change in stance, depending where it hurts. You can think of our horses currently that are in pain. So every so often, Sandy or Bandit or Stony might raise a limb that's quite sore. Otherwise, animals are very good at hiding their pain. So unlike humans, they don't have to have, sorry, and, um, unlike humans, they don't have to have the emotional connection to pain. So um, if I, with us, if we cut our finger off, okay, let's take that as an example, we're emotionally connected to that finger, and therefore we're feeling the pain longer than it actually exists, or we're amplifying that pain more so than an animal would do, and that's in part because of our emotional connection to pain. Dogs and cats don't do this. So dogs, cats, horses, cows, etc., they become very stoic and they learn to hide it quite well, especially in prey animals, such as rabbits. Um, a great example for stoic, being very, very stoic. So an animal, a specific breed that does not show pain, <laughs> is a greyhound. And I've seen this numerous times. Greyhounds are beautiful dogs, but they have very, very thin skin. And I've seen a few come in to the clinic and they've had literally, but because they're running through the bushes with their owners, a, a big branch catches on their skin, on their hind leg, and I've seen one with their entire hind leg missing its skin. And you can imagine, imagine the, the pain that's involved when your epithelial tissue has been ripped off. I'm telling you this dog had a mild increase in heart rate and barely even flinched, didn't even flinch when we, when we were cleaning and scrubbing the wound in order to put a, a nice, decent bandage on it. So they learn to hide it. They learn to become quite stoic. It's our roles as vet techs to identify the very subtle symptoms of pain in certain species and certain breeds and help treat that so that they don't get that wind up to a point where we can no longer control the pain. Proprioception is a sense of body position and movement. So where is the body in space? Stretch receptors in the skeletal muscles, tendons, ligaments, and joint capsules sense movements of the limbs, positions of the joints, state of contraction of the muscles, and the amount of tension being exerted at that time. 
So with that, uh, proprioception is a test that we use for neurological insufficiencies in dogs and cats. And I'll post a video uh, clip showing it, but it's where we place their paw down, and more the vet does this more so than the tech, but would place the paw down with the um, dorsal side touching the table. So they curl their paw under, place it with the dorsal side touching the table, and if the dog or cat has ideal proprioception, they'll flip their paw right back up. If they have neurological insufficiencies, they'll keep their paw dorsal side down, and that's called knuckling. Okay, so some special senses. We have taste, smell, hearing, equilibrium, and vision, and we'll talk about those. Taste, it's also called the gustatory sense. Chemical receptors, taste buds in the oral cavity. So we all have these as well as dogs and cats. There are papillae, which are small elevated structures on the tongue, and these structures on the tongue are also found in the lining of the mouth and the pharynx. So these are all taste buds. So they take the molecules of taste, dissolve them in the mucosa on the papilla, create a chemical change, and they're able to identify if it's tasty or if it's <laughs> not good to eat. Smell is much more important for ta than taste uh, for dogs and cats. However, they go hand in hand. So smell, we all know that dogs and cats and most animals have an extremely um, sensitive sense of smell. And it's also called the olfactory sense. Very important in most non-human animals. Um, main thing with sense of smell, oh, we'll talk about it on the next slide. So there's hair-like processes that project up from these little olfactory cells into the mucus layer that covers the nasal epithelium. So it covers the skin and the mucus on the inside of the nose. Odor molecules dissolve in the mucus and contract, or sorry, contact the sensory processes. And then these are turned into, uh, they're changed through chemical processes and turned into certain smells within the brain. Your clinical application is that you'll learn to recognize the symptoms of an upper respiratory infection in animals. They most often occur in cats and rabbits rather than dogs, and they can be caused by viral or bacterial invaders in the respiratory system. These infections in particular can be really horrendous and they can be very mild and they can cause major swelling in the nasal passages in the eyes. The nasal swelling and discharge can seriously affect the animal's ability to smell their food and subsequently they'll have no appetite. When an animal has one of these infections, the primary concern is to maintain their hydration levels and their food intake and it's not uncommon to have to syringe feed, so force feed, feed these animals and place them on IV fluids until they're better. So any animal that has a clogged up nose is obviously not going to be able to smell very well. They need that sense of smell to best interpret uh, their, their sense of taste. So in order for those chemical reactions to take place and the brain to identify what they're, they're tasting, they need a sense of smell to support that. So then we have the sense of hearing, it's called the auditory sense, and the whole notion of the sense of hearing is that it converts vibrations of air molecules into nerve impulses. Most structures of the ear are located in the temporal bones, i.e. the tympanic bulla of the skull, which we all know about, very much so. The external ear acts as a funnel to collect sound wave vibrations and direct them into the eardrum. The middle ear amplifies and transmits the vibration from the eardrum to the inner ear, and the inner ear contains the sensory receptors that convert the mechanical vibrations to nerve impulses, along with receptors for the equilibrium sense, okay, equilibrium being balance. It is really good to know these and just to know what takes place in which section within the ear. So looking at each individually, the external ear, we have the pinna, which is the elastic cartilage part um, and the skin. And now we talked, did we talk, oh, I'll get back to that. So that's the pinna of the ear. That's the most visible portion of the ear on dogs and cats. The external auditory canal is the membrane line tube. Okay, so it's a thin layer of epithelium and it's a layered tube. Membrane layer tube, line tube, sorry. 
The tympanic membrane is a thin connective tissue membrane, also called the eardrum, and it's stretched across the external acoustic meatus. Now I would like you to have a look at both these videos. You can just click on the hyperlink. There's a ruptured eardrum, which is super cool. Keeping in mind, um, we'll carry on learning about the eustachian tube and such. So when you have a ruptured eardrum, it's talking about the eustachian tube and how that's connected with the throat and therefore the respiratory system. And then the intact eardrum is really important to note and also note the malleus. So when you're looking at the intact eardrum, uh, video, note the malleus, okay, because that is the bone of the ear that is visible when you're looking at the eardrum. Uh, going back, sorry, to the external ear. So uh, um, just for external ear, one thing to think about that's a clinical application is otitis externa. So otitis externa is your common ear infection, happens all the time in lots of different dogs, some cats, specifically labs, golden retriever, any animal that has floppy ears has a higher chance of getting otitis externa. So the bacteria, the foreign body, parasites, or yeast make its way into the pinna of the ear. You can see that within the pinna, the ear canal is, a, is an L shape, okay? So gravity causes it to make its way to the base of the pinna where it's moist and warm. And then that yeast or bacteria or whatever it might be, will flourish and build up, um, you'll get a buildup of ear gunk, okay, of ear debris. And that can be seen with, with the naked eye. When treating these ear infections, it's really important to thoroughly clean the pinna and the base of the external ear canal in order to remove the debris so that the medication can actively work on the epithelium of the ear. If left untreated, these can become middle ear infection, which can be incredibly painful, painful, and they can rupture the eardrum. And this, of course, can affect the animal's hearing. And if really left untreated, it can continue on to affect their balance as well. So the first thing we checked on that cat, um, we had a cat with a head tilt this semester. Her name was Tequila. First thing we check are the ears. Make sure that that eardrum is intact, that there's not a major ear infection to come or happening. And if an animal has an ear, or sorry, a head tilt because of an ear infection, it can take quite some time for that head tilt to go away. It's not instant. Also, if uh, ear infections are left untreated and the dog or cat is scratching incessantly at their ear, you can get an oral hematoma. And that is when the pinna of the ear, the cartilage, which is holding the ear erect, the cartilage and the skin become detached. There's a pocket and fluid fills that pocket. So the ear looks like a little balloon that's filled with blood and that uh, requires a minor surgery to fix. So the middle ear is where the three small bones, also called the ossicles, link the tympanic membrane with the cochlea of the inner ear. The eustachian tube connects the middle ear cavity with the pharynx. That's very important to know. The ossicles act as a system of little levers that transmit sound wave vibrations from the tympanic membrane to the cochlea. The eustachian tube equalizes the air pressure on the two sides of the tympanic membrane. So thinking about your eustachian tubes, uh, just for us as humans, our clinical application, when you're on a plane or if you're diving, and you have an extreme pressure change, they always tell you to chew gum or eat or continuously yawn or swallow. When you're doing all of those actions, your eustachian tubes are opening and relieving the pressure buildup within your ear. So they're opening up into your throat. The malleus, so that bone is the outermost bone. It's attached to the tympanic membrane. The incus, so you've got your malleus. Okay, attach to the tympanic membrane. This would be a really good image to know, just saying. Malleus and your incus is the middle bone. And then you have your stapes, which kind of looks like stirrups. Okay, a little stirrup. It's the medial most bone attached to the membrane that covers the oval window of the cochlea. So sound wave vibrations cause the tympanic membranes and the ossicles in the middle ear to vibrate causes vibration of the fluid around the cochlear duct. Fluid vibration causes the cochlear duct to move. 
that causes the tectorial membrane of the, and the hair cells of the organ of corti to rub against each other, which generates nerve impulses that travel to the brain and are interpreted as sound. Different frequencies of sound wave vibrations stimulate different areas along the organ of corti. We'll talk about that in a sec. And just think as well, as an animal ages, their hearing tends to be less and less, um, uh, another word for good, <laughs> tends to deteriorate over time. And so a good reason for that, one of the main reasons for that, is to note that these are all little joints. So the malleus and the incus have a tiny little synovial joint between each other. And as the animal ages, they can start to develop inflammation and arthritis throughout those bones. So those vibrations, um, the bones aren't picking up the vibrations quite as well, and they're not passing them on as well to the cochlea and the organ of corti, so the brain's not picking up the waves. So the cochlea is the shell-shaped spiral cavity in the temporal bone, and the organ of corti is a fluid-filled portion that makes up the receptor organ of hearing. This particular, this little organ runs along the cochlear duct on the basilar membrane, and it consists of hair receptors supporting the cells and the tectorial membrane. Carrying on. So we have equilibrium, which is balance. So this is a mechanical sense, and it helps maintain balance by keeping track of the position and movements of the head. It involves equilibrium receptors and information from the eyes and proprioceptors. The receptors are located in the vestibule and circum, uh, semicircular canals in the inner ear. This is the vestibule. So the vestibule is between the cochlea, sorry, cochlea and the semicircular canal. It's composed of the utricle and saccule. Hair cells covered by a gelatinous matrix that contain the crystal of calcium carbonate, also called otoliths. otoliths and they generate the nerve impulses that give the brain information about the position of the head. Okay, that's truly the main thing is to know where it is to be able to label this picture and to note that this, uh, the vestibule generates nerve impulses that give the brain information about the position of the head. It occurs in the inner ear and a good clinical application for the vestibule is vestibular syndrome, so often called idiopathic vestibular syndrome can happen in dogs and cats and any other mammal. Most often you see it in old dogs. Idiopathic means we don't know why it happens. There's no good reason why it happens. It's a disease that comes on very quickly. Um, most of them, when the owners call in, they say they think that their dog had a stroke. They're unable to stand, to walk, and they have a head tilt. And, a head tilt, sorry, and or a nystagmus. And a nystagmus is when the eyes are flicking back and forth. They might be nauseous, and generally with these dogs, we rule everything else out, make sure that they haven't had a seizure or anything like that, and give them time. And over time, their vestibular regulation comes back to normal, and uh, their head tilt goes away, and they're able to regulate their movements again. But it is really scary when owners bring them in. So the semicircular canals are located opposite the vestibule from the cochlea. They contain fluid-filled membranous tubes. The ampulla is the enlarged area near the utricle end of each semicircular canal. Okay, there's the ampulla. Ampulla is, uh, with one with an A at the end is singular. AE is plural. So there's the ampulla, semicircle canals, and the nerve of the vestibule, so vestibular nerve. Uh, when the head moves, the fluid movement lags behind the movement of the canal itself. So the fluid within these tubes lags behind. So the movement of the fluid pulls on the cupula and bends the little hairs within these tubes. This generates nerve impulses that give the brain information about motion of the head. So this is, it's working with the theory of inertia that the fluid is lagging behind. And that's why when we spin ourselves in a circle really, really, really fast, the fluid within our ears, within those semicircular canals, is taking a long time to catch up to the movement that's been identified through our eyes and through our proprioception receptors to identify where our body is in space. So this fluid takes a long time to connect those 
to the proprioception receptors and the eyes, and therefore we get really, really dizzy because the body can't tell where we should be in regard to balance. You can think about it if you spin a, if you have a cup filled with water and you put that on a, we call them lazy Susans, the little tray in the middle of the table that spins around. If you put it on one of those little trays, spin it around really quick, that water, even when the cup stops, the water continues spinning because it's continuously trying to keep up to the movement of the cup. If you've ever been to the science center, they used to have a really great example of this in a, in an interactive activity. Okay, I think, uh, where are we at here? Okay, we'll carry on to the eye. So anatomy of the eye. Most components of the eye function to help form an accurate visual image, not to detect it. Okay, so the eye is actually an anatomical component that's uh, forming an accurate visual image. They don't, it's rather than detect it. The photoreceptors that detect the image and generate visual nerve impulses are in a tiny single layer within the retina of the eye. So looking at this one, uh, this is a great, great diagram to know, absolutely. Just note that dogs and cats and animals generally don't have a phobia, uh, depending on their visual abilities, but humans have a phobia. So this is a human eye. And the fovea is a, an intensely dense packet of rods and cones that we'll talk about after. Or maybe we will, maybe we won't. But it allows for the clearest of vision and really clear pictures. So that's how humans came to rely on their vision more than their sense of smell. Dogs have a more developed sense of smell. Uh, photo, oh no, I already talked about that. Okay. Eyeball components. So we have the cornea is a transparent and it emits light into the interior of the eye. The arrangement of collagen fibers, it's an arrangement of college, collagen fibers. There are no blood vessels in the, in the cornea. The sclera is the white part of the eye and it's made of dense fibrous connective tissue. The limbus, just to know, L-I-M-B-U-S, is the junction of the cornea and the sclera. The iris is the pigmented muscular diaphragm. It controls the amount of light that enters the posterior part of the eyeball. Pupil is the opening at the center of the iris. The chorate is between the sclera and the retina. So it's pigment and blood vessels. In most animals, the chorate forms the tapetum, and it's a highly reflective area in the rear of the eye. So the tapetum, tapetum, T-A-P-E-T-U-M, is that highly reflective area in the back of the eye when you take a picture of your animal at night and their eyes are glowing like little aliens. It's because of that component. The ciliary body is a ring-shaped structure behind the iris. It's muscles that adjust the shape of the lens to allow near and far vision. Okay, and that is multi-unit smooth muscles. So the sclera is the white of the eye. We have the posterior chamber, and we have the cornea, which is the clear outer layer of the eye. So posterior chamber, anterior chamber, the iris. Okay, the iris is the colored part. And the chamber is behind the iris or in front of the iris. We have the lens, the ciliary muscles, which are tiny and behind the lens. Zonules, we won't talk about too much. And we'll talk a bit about the optic disc and the retina. And just note that this is all made up of vitreous humor. Okay, the retina lines the back of the eye and it contains the sensory receptors or vision. And this is the rods and the codes, cones. The aqueous compartment is subdivided by the iris into the anterior and posterior chambers. It contains a watery fluid called aqueous humor. This is produced in the posterior chamber by cells of the ciliary body. The vitreous compartment contains a clear gelatinous fluid called vitreous humor. And vitreous humor fills the whole back of the eyeball behind the lens and the ciliary body. The lens is elastic and biconvex. It helps focus a clear image on the retina. 
It's made of layers of fibers. Its front surface is in contact with the aqueous humor, and the back surface is in contact with the vitreous humor. Accommodation is a really important to know. Accommodation is the process by which the shape of the lens is changed to allow close-up and distant vision. Relaxation of the ciliary muscles causes tension on suspensory ligaments, and it flattens the lens. Contraction of these little ciliary muscles releases tension on the sus uh, suspensory ligaments. Okay, it's just another, another image. Okay, so you can see those little ciliary muscles, they either contract or relax. So the retina and the, uh, is formed with the optic disc. So the optic disc is just below the retina. Uh, it's a site where the nerve fibers on the inside surface of the retina converge and leave the eye to form the optic nerve. Photoreceptor cells are neurons with modified dendrites, which I hope uh, you'll chat about neurons and such with Dr. Parr. So the rods are more sensitive to light and the cones are more sensitive to color. As you can imagine, uh, humans have a higher concentration of cones than rods. Um, yeah, and then we talked about the fovea earlier. So the retina, uh, we're just carrying on. The optic disc is the site where nerve fibers on the inside. So I already just mentioned this. <laughs> This is just a different picture. And that's just noting uh, this is the nerve itself. And rather than have the finger-like projections of the dendrite, the end of the dendrite, it's formed into a cone or a rod shape. Extraocular structures that are important to know, we have the conjunctiva, which is a thin transparent membrane. And that's the pink of your eye. So if you flip your eyelid open, it's the mucosa within your eyelid. The eyelids are upper and lower folds of skin lined by the thin moist conjunctiva or conjunctiva. There's the lateral and medial, medial canthus, which are corners where the eyelids come together. Okay, so close to the nose is the medial canthus. Away from the nose is the lateral canthus. And then there are tarsal glands, which produce a waxy substance. Um, that helps prevent the tears from overflowing onto the face. Carrying on, we have the nictitating membrane, which is also called the third eyelid. So this is the nictitating membrane. This is the sclera. If you had a sclera that was that red and you could see all the vessels like that, we would use the term injected. Okay, it's injected. So it's incredibly uh, vascular and quite irritating. Terms to know, conjuncti uh, conjunctivitis is inflammation of the conjunctiva, very common with upper respiratory infections. Blepharospasm or blepharospasm are, is blinking. It's um, twitching of the eyelids. So it's when an animal is irritated in their eye and they'll be blinking or winking quite a bit. Chemosis, so it, conjunctivitis is inflammation. Chemosis is just swelling of the conjunctiva. And the fluorescein dye test is interesting. The fluorescein dye test is a test that uses a certain UV, um, a, a, a dye that's visible under UV light to identify scratches on the cornea. So the cornea is that clear area of the eye. And sometimes if an animal has dry eye or if they get scratched, we can't physically see that scratch. So we have to dye it and have a look at it with UV light to recognize the scratches. We have the lacrimal apparatus. This is the structure or structures that produce and secrete tears and drain them away from the surface of the eye. And then this is just to note about the various muscles that control the eyeball itself. So we talked about the ciliary muscles that work to control the uh, dilation and constriction of the pupil. These ones are the eye muscles that attach to the sclera of the eye, so the white part of the eye, and they're capable of a wide range of movements, dorsal, ventral, medial, and lateral, and uh, dorsal, ventral, medial, and lateral, lateral rectus muscle. So this would be a fairly decent um, picture to know as well. This is the fluorescein dye test. So um, the image up here is identifying how we use it. 
you have these little strips that have a yellow highlighter color dye on them. Add a drop of saline to the strip and drip it into the animal's eye. Give it a second, you'll shine that blue UV type light onto the eye. And then uh, it's a black light, blue light, black light. And then if it's positive, so if the test is positive, then you'll get an accumulation of the dye within the cornea. Okay, so here's a, a positive. So they have an, it's called a corneal ulcer. And they can be tremendously difficult and tremendously painful to treat. When in doubt, if your animal has an eye problem, <laughs> you can always turn to sunglasses. Um, it's really important to recognize stages of problems with the eyes sooner rather than later, whether as a patient, or sorry, as a client or as an RVT. Anything with the eyes is better dealt with sooner rather than later, especially these corneal ulcers. That's when the surface of the cornea is scratched. If left untreated, they can be called uh, melting ulcers. And that's where it continues past the cornea into the aqueous humor and uh, through to the lens, which is quite scary and horribly painful. And it can result in a nucleation. And uh, the term enucleation, E-N-U-C-L-E-A-T-I-O-N, is a surgical removal of the eyeball. That's it.